Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Asia Tech Podcast number 19. Today, we're talking about mobile roaming in Asia. With the booming tourism in the region, what are the opportunities for roaming in the Asian region? And keep it locked for the next hour as we bring you the latest trends in the Asian tech ecosystem. Asia Tech Podcast. Voice of the Asian tech ecosystem. ecosystem. So I went over a bunch of things, obviously, to think about um, talking about today. But I had some interesting meetings this week, right? And I kind of like to talk about things that are topical. And I've heard, I've spent a lot of time talking in the past couple of weeks, actually, about telecoms and mobility. Mm-hmm. Right? So what does that really mean? Well, there's a massive amount of people, if you just break it down, just to Southeast Asia, who are coming in to the region every year, um, something to the order of about 105 million people travel into ASEAN every year. It's most recent statistics. What's interesting actually is the last data that I looked at was for 2014. It's actually 41% higher than it was in 2010. Oh, it's a big jump. Yeah, Yeah, it's a big jump, but it's also outgrowing the rest of the world. So if the rest of the world has an increase in sort of inbound travel about 8% a year. Southeast Asia and ASEAN is having inbound growth of about 18 or 19% a year. Hmm. So it's not uh, it's not going down. And it according to statistics, it looks like it's going to accelerate to about 130 million people a year or more. I think it's 180 million people a year, which probably makes more sense by 2025 or 2030. So you're going to continue to see people come into the region, whether it's business people, tourists, people coming home to visit their families, whoever it is, but they're all coming into the region. Hmm. So if I look at it and I think about it, I wonder what are the biggest issues that are facing these people when they get off a plane, right? So from your perspective, you travel a lot, right? Hmm. What's the first thing you want to do when you get off the plane? Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi. You just want to turn on your phone, right? Yeah. As soon as it, as soon as the seatbelt sign goes off, or even before, people are turning on their phones and trying to connect. And really, all you want to do is make sure that your data plan is off, because you've probably heard horror stories about people getting off a plane from Japan in Italy, looking at a map, and just ending up with, after a week of being there and not really thinking about it, a four thousand dollar bill, a four hundred thousand. Yeah. Being there. Right, you've been there. <laughs> I made a mistake of taking a, a mobile phone many years ago to Australia and using it as a sat nav, <laughs> driving around <laughs> Australia. Right, right. Exactly. right. So I, I know, and and you know, you're a well educated, worldly guy, and you you did it. Everyone I know has done it, and you know, I run, I've run into people in Thailand that have done it as well. I think people are just getting a little bit tired of getting off a plane and having to run around and trying to find hmm. Wi Fi. Right. And, you know, while all telecom operators do kind of offer short term free Wi-Fi, you know, sign up with Facebook. If you're sitting in a coffee shop, I did this when I was in Japan and people that I know actually do travel. And I used to do this right with a Wi-Fi hotspot. Mm. Right. So they'll buy a device that they can share with their friends or with their mom. You know, five devices can connect. You get two gigabytes, five gigabytes of, of data. But that kind of ends up running out pretty quickly, mm. right? You see a lot of Chinese tourists doing that. Yeah, you do, right? So there, there are two sort of secular trends that are taking place, though, right? right? And one of them is you generally don't want to make a phone call when you get off the plane, mm. right? You're very unlikely to call your wife or call your girlfriend or call your kids or call your partner and say, I've landed safely in France. You're much more likely to, while you're either waiting in the immigration line or waiting for your luggage to try to find the closest Wi-Fi spot, right, Mm. and text them or maybe call them on Skype or call them online or call them on WeChat or any of these other sort of data-centric services. But no one wants to do data roaming either, right, So Mm. because it just ends up being egregiously expensive. Now, if you look at what some of the sort of solutions to this problem have been over time, 
you've got plenty of companies out there saying, no problem. And even the local telecom operators will say, no problem. We'll sell you a SIM card. So come into Thailand, come into Cambodia, come into France. It doesn't matter from where you've arrived. But come in and just, you know, get in line, come up to the true counter, come up to the AT&T or the Verizon counter, wherever you are, and just get a SIM card. But what's the problem with that? Hmm. What is it? The biggest problem is, you know, my mother does not know how to change a SIM card. Right? And if you're a business person, when you land in a new country, the last thing you want to do is get a different phone number. Right. Right? Exactly. Think about it. Everybody says, sure, I'll just go and get a SIM card for a week. It'll cost me, you know, $125. I'll get two gigabytes or five gigabytes of data with that, maybe. If I remember, because I've done this too, I've gone to Singapore, right? I've taken my SIM card out. I put a new SIM card in my phone and I forgot to activate the data portion of it, which mm -hmm. you have to of right away. And now all I have is a phone number that nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> and I still well, that was good. Data access, right. And, and again, you know, it's just like you using your phone as a sat navi. It's me. I should be able to figure this out considering right. my background. But the directions yeah. were so unclear at the time. This was a few years ago. Right, so I actually had to go back into 7-Eleven, which is where I bought the SIM card, right, and just go do it all over again. It was a little mm -hmm. bit annoying. But again, it's an old world solution, right? Nobody wants to make a phone call. And then there's, and then there's this whole concept of if you go on to like the Wikipedia pages to look for how to do this, there are plenty of ways to do it. They tell you how to find Wi-Fi spots, right? Mm -hmm. Again, go into a Starbucks, go into any coffee shop. And do that, but then you're restricted in movement as well. Hmm. And in some cases, you have to wait until you get to your hotel. But even in some hotels these days, still they'll charge you fifteen dollars a day right. just for Wi-Fi access. Exactly. It just feels wrong. Yeah, right? and it's never and reliable as well. That's the thing: is any kind of shared Wi-Fi is always pretty weak for what you want to use it for. I mean, if, I know it's designed for the people who want to check one or two emails, but that's kind of not us, right? No, you know, and that's not the other 105 million people that are traveling into Ajian every year either. Let's just say a third of them are business people. They mm. need to have connectivity, right? And what do you think it costs? In the old days, right, you used to be given a BlackBerry. You know, yeah. BlackBerry and their own network too, but they still had their own roaming charges. I was always afraid to ask kind of my IT people, what did it actually cost for me to carry that BlackBerry <laughs> around? Um, because, you know, now people have iPhones, but still, someone's paying for the data access and someone's paying for um, the voice access as well. But here's the thing. Like you said, over the weekend, I was in a hotel, okay, and not in a small, silly little town. I was in like a big industrial town in Thailand. I was in Rayong, right? And... Every time I kind of stepped away from my laptop and shut the cover so I could, you know, go get some coffee or do whatever. When I opened it up, I had to log in again. Yeah. Right. Pain, so, and, I'm, and I'm in my home country. This could not be more of a pain in the butt to do. Right. Mm -hmm. And people have come up with kind of technical solutions and technical packages. Right. So they have these services where. You know, you land in Dubai, let's say, and somebody there meets you again with a SIM card, with some foreign exchange, and I don't know, maybe they, maybe they give it to your, your limo driver and that person takes you to your hotel, and then you're kind of on your own, right? Because you don't even know who to call for service for any of those things, mm -hmm. right? And then I was actually doing some research, and there are also some services that say, no problems, this is really easy. Take a kind of mini or a super micro nano chip almost like a piece of tape, take out your SIM card and put that, attach it to your SIM card. But again, you know, a normal person's not going to want to do that mm. every time they get off a plane. Right. right? They're just not going to want to do it, right? So if you travel today from, from Boston to San Francisco, you can get off the plane, turn on your Verizon package, your AT&T package or whatever it is, and probably in Europe do the same thing. And everything kind of works the way it is. But if you look at the reverse, right? You're a businessman from New York or a businesswoman from San Francisco, and you get off a plane in Thailand. 
Okay, Thailand has three big carriers, two small carriers on, on the mobile side. When you get off, you'll default to AIS, to DTAC, or maybe to True, right? Mm. But if you're not going to switch your SIM card and you're not going to attach a piece of tape to your SIM card, you're not going to run around trying to find a Wi-Fi hotspot, right? What are you going to do? All right, so what would, in your ideal world, what would be the best way to solve this? Well, theoretically, there would be no data roaming charges, right? Right. You well, that ain't kinda... going to happen because there's so much money tied up in that, right? But there is, though, right? And, but it's, it's, too, it's multifaceted, right? First is you only make a phone call, you know, literally under the most extreme circumstances, mm. right? Like your luggage is lost or, you know, your son or daughter just scored a goal or something and, you know, your wife mm-hmm. or your girlfriend wants to call you. Maybe you'll pick up the phone, but all, you'll always say, let me get to a hotspot and I'll call you back. Yeah. Right. And you're right. There's a ton. So a friend of mine actually from Thailand went to Europe in April, met his mom coming from the United States. And I was, again, I was just asking, so what did you guys do for data? And he said to me, well, I just used my mother's phone as a hotspot. And I said, okay, great. What did she do though? Cause the charges must've been egregious. And he said, well, she signed up for a package before she left. It was about $125 or $150. It was $15 a day, I believe. Mm. Right? So they were there for seven days at 70 Yeah, it's $105, $115 for the week, depending on how much data that they use. But that was predicated on the fact that he was always with his mother. Right. Right? Because he didn't get a package from True. He, he was coming from Thailand. Mm. Right? So what would you have to do to solve this problem? Hmm. Okay. Well, first of all, you would need to have the operators either get together and say, because you really have to know network architecture to understand why it's so expensive. Right. So if you think about how the network architecture works, you get off a plane from the United States, you're in Thailand. You connect to the Thai network, but the Thai network can't give you access to anything until it goes back to your home network and verifies that you are who you say you are because they have no way to bill you. Right. And then that comes back and then logs into a data server here in Thailand. And that's true for every country that you, that you travel to. And that's where all the expense comes from. It's just really expensive to do. So how do you solve that problem? Well, in the end, what's going to happen, I think, is that and, – and I actually ran into somebody who's trying to do this. And that's why I thought about this over, over the last like week or so. The, the real point is that a lot of these telephone operators and telecom operators are not nearly as innovative as they look. What are they good at? Well, they're good at setting up billing systems. Mm. They're good at operating a network, right? So they go out and they order kind of off-the-shelf components from Siemens and from Alcatel or whoever makes all these big you know, cell towers and cell boxes and all these things that set up the network. But once they have it, they're really just good at operating it, marketing it, and getting people to, to use it. But they're not really great at innovating around it. Mm. Right? So theoretically, if you go into a data center for a typical telecoms company, you could have multiple third-party boxes sitting in there. I find this actually really interesting. What does that mean? Well, your bank probably co-locates a server inside of the telecoms operator because some of the billing that's going to happen is going to go through the telecoms, right? Mm-hmm. And if you're an airline and you have a mobile service, you probably have a server that's sitting inside there. So they're very used to this concept of having servers sit inside their data rooms. Right. Right? So – and, and if you look at their business models, right, and people have been talking about this for a long time now. But as we said that when we first started talking, very few people use their phone to make calls anymore. And that's whether you're local or international, right? I mean, I can't remember the last time I consistently called somebody without actually texting them first or, you mm. know, voicing them first over some kind of IP, right? Mm. So they're losing all of the revenue that comes from that. And because people are going to Wi-Fi hotspots, right, as opposed to using the data network, particularly when they're traveling. And again, 105 million people is a lot of people coming into a region that aren't using the data network, right? Because they're just, they're not paying for it. They're just going to a Wi-Fi hotspot. 
logging into Facebook and giving Facebook all of the sort of information data over what would be then a non-secure connection to the internet. Mm. Just think about how easy it is to sniff all that data. And in the current context, you know, of global hacking, you saw what happened. Yep. Right? This week, yeah, exactly. I mean, this is the time we live in, right? Yeah, it's really interesting where it's just okay to go out and steal stuff from people. I don't think, do people, do people worry about that though? I mean, when you, when you say like sharing your internet connection with a hundred other people on an open Wi-Fi hotspot, giving away all your Facebook details or even people checking their bank account details. I don't think people really think about it too much, do they? So that's one of the problems associated with roaming, isn't it? You kind of forfeit a little bit of your your natural street smarts when you go abroad, don't you? You kind of think, oh, it's going to be all right. Or maybe you don't care. Or I don't know what drives people. Or maybe people just a bit silly when they go abroad. They don't think about these things. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I'm completely paranoid when it comes to data. So, you know, if I'm sitting in a Starbucks, I may use the connection in there. <laughs> but even when I'm typing in my password, I'm looking over my shoulder <laughs> to see if somebody's doing it. And I actually, I know this is really silly and very paranoid, but... I try to position myself in a place that's like far enough from a camera, which I know is stupid because the cameras are probably good enough to see like an ant from the moon. You know what I mean? <laughs> so like me moving away from a camera is probably not going to do me too much good. But the point is that, you know, you're, you're still going on to a non, a non secure connection. Right. But, but think about this. Let's just say you go to the telecoms provider, right? And you say, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to market a service that allows people for $15 a week to log into my box. So I'll write all the tech for it, right? I'll use your billing system, but I'll do all the verification. I'll do all the things that are associated with it. And then every new person who comes in automatically, right? So with very little friction, create a frictionless system that allows travelers, whether it's business travelers or tourists or just kind of one day people transiting to come into the country and to connect to the network of their service for $15 a week. Mm. No change in SIM card, so you get to keep your same phone number, so in an emergency, your office, your spouse, your partner, your children can call you without thinking about it. And everything just works as soon as you get off the plane. You would do that, yeah? So you are connecting to the, when you're landing in Thailand, you're going to connect to the, the data box, which is going to say, right, okay, this guy's with us. He's a subscriber on our service. And then it would reroute through the, the network operator, right? So right, that would so sit I, between you and the, the operator. Right. So I go into the operator and I say, look, I'm going to build some very fault tolerant technology that's going to use your billing services and other things that you have. But I'm going to run a verification server right. that says, Data only, yeah, because no one's going to use a phone. No one's going to make a phone call, right? Or very few people are going to make phone calls. They're going to use Skype. They're going to use Line. They're going to use WhatsApp or even Facebook to be able to do this. And they want to have all their kind of data packages that they normal, normally have, right? Mm -hmm. Just data. So not voice. You see a lot of companies now saying, sure, like we're in, we run the telecoms company in Laos and we also own a bit of a company in Cambodia and a little bit of one in Thailand and we're going to allow you to keep your same package as long as you're sitting on one of our networks, right? One of our affiliated networks and you can make all the regular phone calls you possibly can. Hmm. But those services don't generally cover data because those are the hard yards and because most people aren't using phone calls anyway, it, in my mind, it makes it look like it's a great service. But in the end, no one's really going to use it, yeah. right? I mean, in a lot of your hotels and service providers and even Uber, you can just do over the net as opposed to having to communicate with people over a real phone line. So data is the real key here, right? And because your telecoms operators feel like we're losing all our voice data anyway, we'll give away the voice for free, which is kind of where it is anyway, right? Like when you sign up for a package, I don't know what it's like in Japan anymore. When you sign up for a phone package in Thailand, you're really just paying for data. Exactly. All the minutes are a bonus, aren't they? Yeah, like the phone, the, the phone call stuff is really just a bonus, but you're really paying for data. Yeah. So again, imagine if you just get – imagine if you, you're in, in the United States and, and your boss says, okay, you've got to take a business trip to, um, to Thailand. 
And you're like, oh God, what am I gonna do for data when I get there? First of all, you don't know anything about Thailand, right? Same thing for Japan, right? You're coming from London, you're flying to Japan, you have no idea, you've never been to Japan, you're afraid of asking people things, you don't wanna go to the counter because you're concerned they don't speak English. And imagine this, let's say you land at a, on a, at a late hour. This has mm -hmm. happened to me. You arrive in Tokyo, you arrive in Thailand, it's one o'clock in the morning. That DTAC shop is not open. Yeah. Right, so your point of most convenience, which is the airport, for a bunch of things, and we'll talk about other services in a second, right, that you can use your mobile phone for. But your, your ability to get that done once you leave the airport is really limited. Mm. Right, again, I tried to do this. So I, I, I was late for a business meeting in Singapore. I just said, never mind, I'm just gonna jump into a taxi. And you know, on the way from the airport into the city, I have no connectivity. Yeah. Right? I can't text somebody. I can't do anything. I can't tell anybody back in my home country that I landed safely, even though they know I did, because they would have read about it, right? Mm. But still, it's just frustrating. And so, it happens a lot here in Japan when people come, especially when people come from Europe and America. They come to Japan and they just assume that they're going to get Wi Fi, free Wi Fi. Right. They're just used to it, right? So, they right. come to Japan. The first thing that people will say to you, tourists are, I can't get free Wi-Fi. So they really struggle. And, you know, unless you're going to find a Starbucks, I mean, you'll find a Starbucks eventually, but even then it's probably not good enough, right? Right. In Japan, correct me if I'm wrong, part of the issue in Japan was that the commercial code, which changed, I believe, in the last year or so, actually required the operators, whether they wanted to or not, to charge you for Wi-Fi. Yeah. They there had some to issues, charge you. right? Right. I forget exactly what it was. I believe that that's mostly been resolved. And a widespread, you know, a lot of data packages which are well established, you know, going back 10 years. So everybody had data. So, you know, and only recently have people got used to foreigners coming to Japan and demanding data packages or Wi-Fi, right? Right. Up until that point, not many people went to Japan as tourists and the locals all had data packages. So there was no demand for it, right? No, it didn't matter. You could go into a, it didn't matter. You'd sit in a Starbucks, you'd just use your own package. Yeah. And actually back, I want to say back in the day, but this was only like six or seven years ago, I actually carried a pocket Wi-Fi hmm. in Tokyo when I lived in Tokyo. Right. And I'm struggling to remember why I would have done that. I think it was because, <laughs> no, I know why actually. I know why. And the reason why was because when the data services first came out, tethering was not That's available. Right. It and was technically still possible. Is. Still, in some, yeah. still, still some operators will block it by default, right? Right. So I actually had to get a pocket Wi-Fi from SoftBank so that I could use my laptop. Right. Which used to drive me berserk. <laughs> but I did do it. Anyway, so I ran into this, I ran into this service – I've got some very, I ran into these guys, right? Very um, experienced mobile operators and they, they've built mo mobile businesses. These are like real technologists that have built real mobile businesses in Eastern Europe and in Southeast Asia. And what, they're, what they've said is, what they're proposing to do is actually build exactly what I just said. And they've actually started to build this where mm. before you leave your home country, you log into their service. You say, I'm going to be in Thailand from, you know, whatever it is. July 17th until July 24th. And during that time period, I'm going to sign up with your local operator, whoever they are. You tell me, is it DTAC? Is it AIS? Is it true? Is it one of the smaller ones? And as soon as I get off the plane, I get data. Mm. Right? So my, phone's, my phone is still the phone that I have. I don't have to change my SIM card. I don't have to do anything. And the data that I use is charged at $15 a week for whatever the package is, right? Mm -hmm. 10, 10 gigabytes for the full week. Now, most people over a one-week period are not using 10 gigabytes of data. They're just not, right? And because of the way the mobile phone operators have set up their, their data systems here, they won't get overrun by data anyway because no one's going to use that much data. And if you're here for a longer period of time, you know, you're just going to look like a local Who's using the who's using the um, the data system to work? But you would do that, wouldn't you? Yeah, and his I think with that you'd probably pay more just for the convenience and the lack of sticker shock as well, right? Because one of the the big fear factors is if you were to go, how much you're going to end up paying on the bill 
a month later or two months later, right? But if somebody could say, look, it's going to be this much, this is how much you're going to pay, nothing more, nothing less. To me, that sort of control and transparency is worth money. Yeah, absolutely. But again, what these what these guys have done, they've done research, and what they're basically saying is they can run a viable and large business, right? If you think about 105 million people, that's now, but it'll be 180 in a few years, coming into the region, mm. signing up for a package before they arrive, getting off a plane, and instead of having to look for a Wi-Fi hotspot at any point in time, no matter where they are in the country, as long as the local telco and the mobile operator has coverage, which they will have, then you get all of your data access, which means as soon as you land, you can use Skype, you can use Line, you can use Facebook, you can post on Instagram. These are the things that kind of millennial travelers want to do, right? They want yeah. to get off, take a picture of themselves in the brand new airport with their, you know, with their friends. They want to say, share, right? Yeah, yeah, they want to share. That's the whole point. And they haven't been able to do that up until now. How do you... How do you pitch that idea, that service to a mobile operator? Just thinking from my own experience, you're going to go to a, a mobile operator and you're going to find a guy who's the product manager of data or the product manager of data roaming, and that's his thing, right? And I wondered, when you go and approach somebody like that, is he seeing this service as something that's taking revenues away from his product line? Or was he just going to look at it like he would an MVNO and said, right, okay, if we can, you know, if we can gear our business this way, we can outsource this much, we'll lose a bit of money, but we don't have to bother about marketing this stuff, right? So we can just kind of section off this part of our, you know, our data traffic, sell that off to these guys, fine. It's all money in the bank. How do they react to that? So it's a really good question, right? So most of the mobile operators will make their money for, for roaming charges in reverse, right? So when you land in Thailand or you land in Japan and you have an AT&T package back at home, AT&T is the one who's making all the money. Now, they might have a revenue sharing agreement with the local telecom company, but AT&T is going to take the, um, the bulk of that revenue, right? Because that's, their, that's where they make, get their data roaming fees from. The local operator just provides the pipe. The, the, the foreign operator comes in they use their, some of the technology. They pay some kind of licensing fee, but they, they're not going to pay a ton of money to the local operators, right? Because there's no mm-hmm. fixed way to figure out what it is and the way the networks are set up. They're set up for billing, not for that kind of usage. So what you do is you walk in and you say, say to them, look, you're going to get a tourist coming in here, and they're going to go find a Wi-Fi hotspot, and they're never going to pay you anything, and they won't make a phone call either. Mm. So what I'm going to do for you is – I'm going to open up your business to another 100 million potential clients. And I'm going to be able to build you, you know, fault tolerant um, systems you can sort of attach to your network as a value add service, the same way you have plenty of other value add services like, you know, video on demand on on your network, um, ticketing on your network, your airline connect, all this kind of stuff that you already have, but you did not build. And I'm going to do a revenue share with you. And if you go and look at the numbers, right, you'll see that this is just extra revenue. Mm -hmm. So it's not even a loss leader for the mobile operators. It's potential extra revenue for for them at scale because it opens them up to literally 100 million new clients that they wouldn't otherwise have that would have potentially just gone to a Starbucks or some Wi-Fi spot and used that, right? Because – Today, when I, use my, um, when I use my phone locally, I use True as my service provider. I also get access to all their Wi-Fi hotspots as part of the deal that I sign with them. Now, I normally wouldn't use it, right, because I have data access. And it's essentially unlimited data, mm-hmm. right? And because most people on their mobile phones are not downloading movies, although I've seen people do it, right? But they're not downloading like a full year of some Netflix uh, series, but see, if I'm so, – so they don't make any money off of that. But for every foreigner that comes in, they now have a new potential client. And remember, the foreigners aren't here for long either. Most foreign travelers are in a, new, are in a country for three days. And they'll pay $15 for three days. But just think about, you know, think about 15% of 100 million people paying $15 on top of um, their normal phone charge that they have back at home. 
everybody who comes into the country would do that. Yeah, it's all profit for the operator, the local operator. A, yeah, and if you do if you do a revenue split with the local operator, again, all I've yeah. done is put a box on there, and I've got three days of extra network traffic or two days of extra network traffic for everybody that comes into the country on average. Right, some people will stay longer. And most people actually travel to two countries. Yeah. So, right? So imagine I land in Thailand. I spend a few days in Bangkok. I go down to um, Siam Reap because I want to see Angkor Wat. But when I'm there, I want to take pictures, post them on Instagram, put them on Snapchat, you know, put a little <laughs> virtual reality or augmented reality. I want the dog face and the bunny ears on me while I'm sending my pictures back to my friends in Canada. Mm-hmm everybody's going to do that, or at least a large percentage of people will do it. And the question is always, right, is, is this, why don't the mobile operators who have access to all this technology and must have the best sort of technical people in the world, why wouldn't they just do it themselves? Mm. Well, again, why wouldn't IBM have built the relational database? Why did they let Oracle go out and do it? Well, and you, you they- mentioned it earlier, didn't, didn't you, that these are not innovative cultures, they're not right. They're they're sort of mindset. They're a bit like the, in a way that they're better positioned, but they behave in many similar ways to the record labels of old. Right? They're defending yeah. the revenues. Right? They right. they have a cash cow which they don't want to change. I mean, they've only been forced to get into data because you know their, their voice revenues were going down, and SMS right. was running out. Right? So, right. These are not by default innovative organizations so right right and nor are they filled with a bunch of technologists remember we talked earlier right. about the fact that they're buying off-the-shelf components from you know mobile equipment um, yeah. manufacturers and they're just operating that system so someone comes in trains them up and these are just like big marketing and operations companies yeah utilities right, right? Yeah, but essentially they do three things right they market to you and tell you that they're better than some other operator they set up a billing system so that they can bill you themselves and they can also attach value-add services or what they consider value-add services. They can then use their billing systems. And they've got, you know, part of the billing system is, you know, they have logins and they have, um, you know, databases that record who is and who is not a subscriber. So who can and can't use the system for verification purposes, right? Mm. And then they just have a, um, <clears throat> a marketing arm. Excuse yeah. me, an operations arm, and that's it in billing. Those are the three things that they do. So your question, getting back to your question, when someone comes to them, like these, this team that I met last week, and says, we will open up your business to a bunch of other clients, in a way, they'll just go, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? Without even really, I mean, of course, they're going to think about it, because anytime you put something new on your network, you're going to, you know, you have a whole bunch of other issues to be concerned with. But once you can prove it in a test environment that this actually works and that it's safe, there's no reason why they won't go out and let you do this. And to them, it, like you said, it's just free revenue. Exactly. No subscriber acquisition costs. Nothing. Exactly. And here's what's really interesting. If you go out and do your research, right, and again, this is not me talking, but this is some research that, uh, that these guys have done. What do you have when, you, when you're at an airport before you take off or when you land at an airport before you get your luggage? The one thing you have that you don't want is time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but you really don't, right? I mean, what's the, when you land at an airport, what's the first thing you want to do? It's just get out. Yeah. Right? Even if it's a domestic flight, you don't want to wait to pick up your luggage. You don't want to wait to go. I mean, obviously, for international, you don't want to go through immigration. You don't want to have to get hassled with customs. All you really want to do is get out. And while you're waiting for your luggage, if you have brought luggage with you, and it's very likely you have if you're traveling to two or three different countries, right? all you really want to do when you're sitting down at the luggage carousel is log in. Yeah. Right? Everybody's doing it. Everybody, and even if you're just like reading a book or looking at, we still call them newspapers, but you understand the point, right? Um, and start taking pictures of your shoes or whatever it is, you know, silly. I used to do this when I traveled, um, mostly domestically, but sometimes internationally. You know, I was always shocked at the things that people would wear on an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> you it's know, not like one of those Walmart blogs, what people wear at Walmart. Yeah, it's kind of, it was kind of like that. I forget what I called it. I had a Medium or was it Medium or what was that other thing? Tumblr. I had a Tumblr, Tumblr page 
that was just like funny stuff you see in an airport. You know, did your mother really let you leave the house dressed like that kind of thing? <laughs> And I saw some of the most amazing things, but that's really what people want to do, right? Is they want to use their mobile phone system to take pictures, share stuff, whether it's to be funny or yeah. just to prove to people that they're safe. Yeah. Anyway, so I spent a lot of time now talking to these guys. I, I think this is a killer idea. Hmm. Okay. And this is unlike, you know, I, I look at this from multiple perspectives, right? But one of the reasons one of the reasons is that um, I see a lot of startups. I'd say every week I see ten to fifteen new businesses, right? Which is relatively straightforward for most people that that do what I do. And you know, this is a different type of business than most of the stuff that I see because most of the stuff that I see is all software based, but this is hardware based as well, mm. right? So well, it seems, seems a relatively straightforward idea. Why hasn't it been done already? Well, because, what do these guys got? Well, first of all, these guys have got at least 15 years each of um, mobile telecoms development. So they've started right. telecoms companies and helped other, you know, helped the operators build out the technology. Just like we said before, um, a, a normal, like the guy who runs True, which is, you know, obviously owned by CP, they don't know anything about telecoms, but they do know that they should own a mobile operator. Hmm. So you hire a bunch of people with technical skills, which is what this team has, and some marketing skills as well, and they say, build me a mobile operator. And they've done this two or three times, which is really interesting, actually, when you think about it. And I sit down. This is one of the greatest things about what, what I get to do, right? And I think you kind of do a similar thing in Japan is you meet these people, and you never know – like the ins and outs or the intricacies of like how a mobile phone system works. But now I kind of know a little bit. Hmm. It's just fascinating what these people know. You know, it's like I always used to say, you know, you stand on a train platform in Japan and every now and then you'll see like a young kids pick a fight with like a guy, who, an older man who bumped into him. And you just watch this and you'd be like, you know what, you don't know if that older guy has been practicing karate for the past 35 years. <laughs> like, you just don't know. Yeah. And, and you'd see it, and these, these kids would just get beaten up sometimes, you know, quickly. Not It wasn't like a long fight, but it was a very quick kind of surgical strike where they'd give some older guy some flack, and the guy would be like, yeah, sure, right, boom. And they'd knock the kid down, and the kid wouldn't know it hit him. Because yeah. you can't tell what people know just by looking at them. And it's kind of the same <laughs> – I know it's kind of long-winded. But it's kind of the same thing with these guys that know telecoms. You would see these guys walking down the street and wouldn't know you started a telecom, a mobile telecom company yeah. in Eastern Europe. Like you just wouldn't know it and yet they have. And when they sit down and explain to you, like it, it's really non-trivial, right? So the question is why hasn't somebody done this already? Um Again, it's a, it's a multi-layered answer. One is most people don't have the embedded knowledge to be able to do it, right? But two is most people up until now, we're hitting an inflection point, right, haven't traveled to a place where somebody else wasn't paying for their data, hmm. right? And, the, and the, the more prevalent that the tech gets, the smaller it gets, and the more mobile everybody gets, the more likely you're going to have a company. Think about it. Let's say you're at Goldman Sachs and you sell one executive every year for two weeks to Hong Kong, right, for meetings and to meet clients. That trip alone could cost like ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars, and and five to ten thousand dollars of that could just be data and telecoms. Yeah, it's expensive. So then if you take a company that has 30,000 people in it, if 10,000 of them are traveling a year, how much money could they save? If instead of having a $2,000 bill for that two weeks, they have a $30 bill. Hmm. So imagine on, from a B2B perspective, you build this network out and then you go to Goldman or Merrill. I'm just thinking about it from a finance standpoint, right? Because that's what I'm most familiar with, but it can be advertising or automotive manufacturing or air conditioning. And you just say, look, Every person that travels in your company should sign up for this service because when they're gone, all they do is pay $15 a week for data. Mm -hmm. And that data then allows them to call you. And if you need to reach them when they're in Shenzhen, right, because they're going there for some kind of manufacturing conference, you don't have to think about which phone number they're on because right. they're just on the phone number that they've always had. So the potential market for this is gigantic, but no one's really had to do it before because nobody was paying for it personally, right? It's almost like 
you look at the cost of an international school in Tokyo, right? You look at the cost of Yokohama International School. Very few people pay for that themselves. Right, exactly. Right? Disney is paying for that for their senior executives. So nobody cares what it costs. Mm. But now people are starting to care what it costs and people are starting to travel more and more and more as the world becomes just more globalized and more international. And I'm telling you, if you build this thing, and remember we talked about why wouldn't a mobile operator do it? They don't have the embedded knowledge, mm. right? But also, if you think about why it's happening in Southeast Asia, all the telecoms companies are new. They're very open to some of these value-add services, and they don't know how to do it themselves. And the people that could potentially approach them and will approach them can say, we're going to increase your potential client base by 100 million people, and you've just done nothing. Yeah. So I think that's why it hasn't happened up until now. But I think once it does happen, it's going to be one of those things, kind of like Uber, where people will look at it and say, that that was so obvious. Yeah, definitely. Who who would be the losers in this situation? Would it be the outbound operators who are selling roaming packages from your home country? These are the ones, you know, like your Goldman Sachs example. It would be the Goldman Sachs in Japan sending the execs to Southeast Asia. It would be the, the operators in Japan who are making money selling roaming packages to Japan-based execs going abroad. They're the losers in this situation, right? They could be, unless the there's a balance of trade when it comes to travel, right? Because those mobile operators will make money as new people come into the country and they get the benefit of the new right. data packages that they get to sell. And then when their executives go to another country, they get the same benefit. So I, it could be like a zero sum. In other words, SoftBank in Japan will benefit when people come into Japan and – you know, T-Mobile in the United States will benefit and that could offset each other. But it's just new revenue, remember. Right. The, the other reason why the telecom companies are um, would be open to this is because they continue to see their voice business deteriorate down to nothing. Hmm. So anytime someone comes to them and says, you're not going to make any more money off of this, but now you could actually make equal and maybe offsetting and much more money off of this because the number of potential clients is so much larger and it seems to me that this type of travel whether it's business travel or leisure travel is just not going to stop right yeah. even if it's only growing eight percent a year just think about how, how that compounds over time mm -hmm. right and we know you know look at what your children do with their phones mostly they're mostly sharing stuff and most of it's data Right. I mean, you know, my daughter almost never makes a phone call, but yeah. she's constantly chatting with people and constantly sending pictures, whether it's at the dinner. We've talked about this in the context of other things. Right. And I saw this, too, when I went to Japan in December or in January. I can't remember. Um, you know, I sat down at the breakfast table and my friend's daughter and her two friends who had slept over on the Friday night woke up on Saturday morning and they literally put their phone down on the table and we're using data, right? Mm. So they're using Wi-Fi in the house to talk to their friend in Maryland. And they just left it open for like an hour. Right. That's how they do it, right? That's how they do it. So that's going to continue. And that's why this business model, because remember, there's tourism in Thailand is something like, I think it's like 15% or more of GDP. So people will continue to come into the country and they'll continue to come into ASEAN as well. And also inter-country travel is also very high. If you look at the statistics, something like 58% of the travelers inbound are coming from other countries in the region, right? So you had mentioned earlier, well, what happens if, you know, they just have an agreement amongst each other not to have roaming charges for voice? Well, in the end, the voice stuff we figured out doesn't matter, right? Right. No it's money. the data, and they're never going to stop charging for data. I mean, never is a long time, right? But you know, over the next ten or so years, they're probably not going to start stop charging for data. They're probably just going to because more and more people are going to use data as mm. opposed to voice. So this is a business that I see as heavily sustainable in the region for a long time, and also a great place again to try because as more and more tourists come in to Bangkok, to Chiang Mai, to Phuket to Koh Phi Phi, to all these places, Koh Samui, right? 
they're going to need to have data right. access. This is the this seems to me like the perfect business to do it. So when I met these guys, I just thought, you know, I went out and did all this research on what the existing solutions were to it, and this blows them all away because it's frictionless, right? Again, you sign up before, you tell this thing where you're going, and then it just plans out which operators you use when, when you get there. Now, we haven't talked at all about what's one of the other big pain points for a traveler and what else could you bundle with this service. Well, when you land, you're going to need cash, at least in the early stages, for some things, right? Mm. So foreign exchange is the single largest like money business in the world by definition because it is the money right and if you think about how much money gets traded even just for traveling and the fees that are associated with that if you bundle a foreign exchange business with this sort of data access business you now have two massive places where you can make money and i think that that's one of the things that this company is going to do as well so the whole package that they're going to offer is going to be really compelling but again we go back to this every single time we talk about an interesting business model what else are they going to know about you well, they're going to know where you came from, right? The origin of your trip. They're going to know which airline you flew. They're going to know when you arrived. They're going to know your entire itinerary. And all that data has value. We'll address that in a second when we talk about that's a big surprise mm. because that's part of that as well. But you can see how that tra is going to translate into a massive amount of data. And once you have all that data, just think about the types of services you can sell around that, right? Because I know if you're flying business class, yeah? Mm -hmm. I know what time you're landing. I could potentially know where you're staying because if I offer you as part of a package an Uber connectivity or a Grab Taxi, I know where you're going as well. So now I know how much money you have. I can guess your income level. These are these are things that are going to make a business like this really powerful, I think. And you've got a billing relationship to boot, so to you can boot. you can upsell all those services, everything from what you've just said to insurance, everything, everything. Yeah. So pa you partner with the insurance companies, but also you partner with, you know, um, any other tourist company like uh, you know, book my local fun right. stuff via do tour, at night. all those kind of what? packaged tour, yeah. the, the experienced tours, which are big growth sure. area, right? Sure. Right, so those 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 tours don't want to handle this no. type of business because it's way too technical for them. But boy, they'd love to get access to all right. the people coming into the country, whether it's for cooking classes, wine tasting. And they're all outsourced anyway, right? I mean, they're all they don't run the tours themselves; they outsource nope. them to local people. So they're just a broker. So if you could then stick their people in front of your people, everyone's a winner, right? Yeah. So this is just a mar This is just a marketplace. Right. The, these these experience the local thing businesses are just marketplaces. Like you said, they're not running their own tours. They're just connecting you to the tours and curating, hopefully, so you can find the best ones. Mm. Anyway, this is, you know, normally, I guess people would listen to me talk and say that business is horrible. But this is a business that I absolutely love. And the more I think about it, the more I like it. Mm. Um, because, you know, people always say, oh, you can't start a new travel business because you can't compete with Agoda and you can't compete with Priceline and all this other stuff. But in fact, you can. And I think these guys are going to do it. So I really like this trip ally business quite a bit. Is there anything about the model that you think or anything not specifically about their model or that sector that they're in that you would say is a concern? Would you say is a question mark over that kind of business? Something which they maybe don't have any control of, over or something which, you know, unforeseen events or whatever. I mean, what would you say would be the weak, the weakest link in that kind of a business? It's just security and integrity, right? Data integrity, right? Um, anytime you have a hundred million new customers, you don't know what they're going to do when they get on your network. Hmm. Yeah. And in like, like we talked about earlier in the current environment where people are using for lack of a better term, you know, cyber security holes and cyber attacks to influence everything from elections to just like whether a hospital's lights go on and off when you saw what happened. Right. Even in Japan, I think some of the stories were that a newspaper was affected or I can't even remember what it was, right? But we talk about this, yeah? Once you have a – just to get back to what we were talking about last week, 
if you have an autonomous vehicle, by definition, that vehicle is going to be getting real-time data from somewhere. It's going to be getting real-time data from the network, and that's going to be likely the same network that all these new people are logging on to, right? Mm-hmm. Unless they're going to build a completely separate internet or a completely separate data transmission mechanism for these self-driving cars, which they have not done for other sectors, then you run the real big risk of hacking and data integrity. But I don't think that's going to be any different than any other business that's going to get run. But it's definitely going to be a big concern. And I think over mm-hmm. time, you know, the segue really is, um, you know, how big is cybersecurity going to be, particularly in the current environment? It's never going to go away. And mm-hmm. it's just going to get worse and worse over time, right? You know, in the old days, you would say you don't want to have nu- nu- nuclear proliferation but in a way, like, if think about just think about what happened this week. The president of the United States of America let into the Oval Office. Okay, first of all, he took out the local press, so nobody else could record what's going on. Yeah. He had foreign, he had foreign press in there. But this is just how, the silliness. And I don't want to talk about politics necessarily, but just from a data integrity standpoint and security standpoint, right? Why it's so important. He the foreign press was in there, right? And the foreign minister from another country who's essentially a spy true for every country right this is not just russia it's like the foreign minister the ambassador of every country in another country is always some kind of spy mechanism right um and who's i I can't remember what the other guy does but both of them are spies they're just sitting in the oval office chit-chatting i mean they could literally drop like a listening Mm -hmm. device anywhere and again, that's connected to the internet. And once you have that type of stuff, you've got data integrity and data security problems. And I think that's the biggest risk, but that's the biggest risk for everybody. Right. But they didn't need to, right? Because the president was happy to give it all away anyway, right? <laughs> yes, well, that's the point. <laughs> <Please>. <laughs> they don't need to bug the place. He's happy to show, show you what he knows. Yes, but uh, look, I just got out of the shower and I'm naked, but I don't really care if you just come into my room and watch me get dressed. <laughs> I know, it's complete silliness. There we go. Anyway, so I, I like that. I think this whole concept of um, mobile operators and mobility as it, as it relates to building new businesses around data as opposed to voice, we're going to start to see happen a lot more. Mm. As always, I think a lot of this stuff is going to happen in Asia first because there's a bigger need for it here. Right? Again, one of the things we talk about is traveling from Boston to San Francisco doesn't engender a whole lot of problems for data packages and, um, and roaming charges. But literally, when you walk over the border from Malaysia into Thailand, now you're on a different operator. Yeah. And that happens every day, all day, right? And it's really easy to test this stuff, too. You just go into Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar, whatever, where all these new telecom operators are, and you say, can I get on your network? And they say yes, and you just start testing it there. And once you do that, now you've built a business that's so big. And remember, it's technically very difficult to do this, right? Very difficult. And once you've done it, then you go to the United States and go to Europe and say, we can do the same thing for you. Mm-hmm. You've got inbound travelers. Your voice business is dying, and we can give you hundreds of millions of new customers. And I think everybody's going to want to do that. So I think that's a great idea. And it's going to happen here first. What was the name of the business again, Michael? Trip Ally. T-R-I-P-A-L-L-Y. I think it's dot .world, if I remember correctly. Yeah, Trip Ally dot .world. These guys are good, mm. really. Um, and I think they're going to build a really big business awesome i like yeah, it. anything I like- that deals with pain points which are unnecessary pain points in the system in the delivery of a service anything that deals with infrastructure especially telecoms is something that always interests me yeah agreed it's not necessarily think- the sexiest technology out there but it just works and it does you know i think it's the area that people tend to overlook because they always chase the shiny objects right but actually there's so much to be made out of delivering good service Yep. Absolutely. And that's why I love these guys. And this is why they'll walk into the offices of most, you know, advisors or or most venture capitalists and they'll say, I don't get it. Like, I can't tell people I'm working on this because it's not going to like no one at the dinner table or at my dinner party is going to think I'm really cool if I'm building this. And I can't really explain it to them because I don't understand how a mobile operator works. And no one's ever going to let you do this because why wouldn't Google just build it type of thing. And in the reality, the reality is if you just listen to them talk, which I've done over the past few weeks, you just sit there and think, oh, my God, this is just a massive opportunity. Nobody's doing it for that reason because it's not sexy. And if they can accomplish what they say they can, it's going to be huge. Anyway. Trip out. Yeah, I like it. Watch Mm. this space.
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Watch it. Um, anyway, so we like to talk. We like to talk at the end of um, every episode about surprise. Things. Yeah, what's the big surprise? What's well, the big surprise? Um, you know, at least once a week, if not fifteen times a week, in the news in Southeast Asia, you see a company that gets funded, and you see people doubling down on funding, and you know, this is a business that feels to me like it really shouldn't and we talked about it in the in the context of food delivery and um supermarket delivery but i want to talk about it maybe the surprise is a little bit different this time if you think about right. it a little bit more deeply right so they're going to do a laundry service they're doing a laundry service and this is a business that was started in indonesia i can't pronounce it so i'm not even going to try ali hasa um, or ali jasa yeah i think it's probably hasa right but yeah ali you're hasa better, ali hasa you're probably better at that than i am but they originally started with, you know, they wanted to kind of be like a multi-service provider for everybody's home. I think there are issues with that in Southeast Asia because getting service, the cost of human capital is so low. Hmm. And there's not a lot of friction in it anyway. But what they're trying to do is they're saying, you have laundry, you fill a bag, we'll charge you basically $3.75. Let's just round it to $4 a bag. and Whatever you can stuff in there, we'll clean and you just think, God, so they're going to have to do delivery. Hmm. You just think about what the traffic's like. We talked about this last week in Jakarta. That's going to be a pain point. Um, if they don't show up on time or if they show up an hour late, no one's going to really be happy about this, right? Um, and all the things surrounding this business to me seem like it's going to go away over time. And most people have maids at home that do their laundry for them. Right. I'm not yeah. saying that that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just saying that that's kind of a fact. The target market already has people at their home that are doing their laundry for them. But let's just say you can convince someone to use this service, right? And they use what I call and what um, <laughs> kind of the technocratic United States likes to call. They use the Jeff Bezos graph. What is that? Well, we've sold more, you know, Amazon Echoes than we've ever sold before. That's right but you don't know how many we sold last quarter, so you're multiplying a number that you don't understand right. by a, that's just more than the previous. Do you know what I mean? Like we've sold three times more Amazon Fire phones, but last quarter we only sold one, so this quarter we sold three, and I'm not talking about millions. Anyway, so they've said the same thing, that their business has tripled in the last two years or something. Mm. It doesn't mean much to me because I don't know what it was to begin with, and the amount of money that they raised is undisclosed, so the whole thing's in a shroud of secrecy. But I've thought about this a little bit more. Maybe the surprise is on me. Um, you know, live and learn a little bit. What do they know <laughs> if they're doing your laundry? Well, one, they know where you live. Mm. Right, for sure. They know what your payment methodology is, right? So they know if you're using a green American Express card or a platinum American Express card, right? They know how many bags you have. So do you have one bag of laundry every week or three bags? They know how many times you're changing your clothes and how big your family is, right? They know what neighborhood you live in so they can guess again what your income level is. And they also know what kind of clothing you have, right? So do you have a bunch of no, no name brands or is it all like Ralph Lauren and Chanel or whatever, Hermes shirts that you're going to get dry cleaned as opposed to just hand washed, right? With all this information, then maybe they can serve you other products, right? And I was thought about this. Let's say they run a laundry, they run a laundry delivery business, right, or a laundry doing business under the name Ali Hasa. And let's say they run a supermarket delivery business under a completely different brand, but you don't know that it's the same company. And then let's say they run a money back business. So every time you do go shopping yourself, you take a picture of your receipt and you send it to them and you get a 5% discount. Why would they do that? Well, because now they know what you're buying. And if you put a little conglomerate like this together, and this is where I thought, you know, maybe the, that's a big surprise is on me because if they brand all these individual services with separate names, they get all this individual data on you, and now they know where you live, how much you're spending on services, what your laundry bill is, what you're wearing, right? How you pay for things. And from that, all that data, they can figure out literally who you are, what you like, where you go, when you travel. Because if for three weeks you're not sending them any laundry, but the other 49 weeks out of the year you are, they know you're on vacation. Hmm. All these, th and they can figure out when you come back, you've got six bags of laundry. All this is information to them that then they can sell to other providers, whether that's directly to the phone company or to e-commerce companies or to 
anybody else that wants that data. And that alone could be a gigantic business. You have to set that up from the get-go though, right? You have to approach and say, this service, this laundry service is not going to be our main profit maker, right? This is going to be almost like the lost leader that we're going to use to get into your home, to build a relationship, to collect data on you. And then we're going to build services on top of that, the profit optimizers, right? Yep. But you've got to go from the beginning, haven't you? You can't sort of build that around a sort of a, a mom and pop type laundry service which it may be sort of cobbled together hundreds of those right yeah so i don't know how they've they've done that it seems like i'm just reading the news that they have gone in at the beginning trying to offer different services like ac yes. repair and home cleaning yes so maybe they have got that approach and that they've decided well actually let's just focus down on laundry but we don't know pretty, do we? we don't know but it's pretty brilliant if they have in other words if they're right. saying because I could come and knock on your door and say, Graham, can you tell me um, how many credit cards you have? How big is your family? Right, right, exactly. When you're going on vacation? You live here. You own this place. You rent. Like, you're never going to tell me that. Yeah. And what kind of toilet paper do you use? And what's the thing you're, you know, that you use when you do your lawn? Like, you're never going to tell me that. But if you shop with me, you've now told me that by definition. And now I know everything about you without ever having to ask. It's a brilliant way to do this business. And like I said, if you aggregate a few of these little businesses together, right, you call – and you can call it whatever you want, right? You call them one of them Ali Hassa. You call the other one like Blibli, which is another business in Indonesia. And you call the other one is like a baby-facing business, right? So you know who's having a baby. You know all that kind of stuff. Now you've got a ton of data. And now you take that data and you sell it to Lazada. Mm. Now, now you're talking about a massive business. Or you sell it to Alibaba who can afford to buy the data so they can build their Lazada business bigger. It's just a really interesting concept that I've been thinking about recently. Right. It, that leads me to believe when you now, because now as an investor, right, you sit down and you talk to them and you say, are you really going to make a ton of money off of this? And they say, well, look, we're not going to tell you this unless you sign an NDA, but here's what we're doing really. Mm. We have five of these individual brands. And the reason why we got out of the AC business is because we started another company called Ali AC and all these other different brands that no one knows about. And there is um, there is precedent for this, right? And this is why I started thinking about this, besides the fact that I've talked to some other really smart people about this, right? Just think about the old General Motors model, right? The Alfred P. Sloan model is the first car you buy could be a Pontiac or it could be a Chevrolet, but then you're going to buy a Buick, and then you're going to buy a Cadillac or an Oldsmobile first, and then you're going to buy a Cadillac. And I own the whole stack and I know now how old you are when you buy the Buick, how old you are when you buy the Oldsmobile, and how old you are when you buy the Cadillac. And now I can target people in that range to do it. And now, no matter what stage you are in your, you know, in the economics of your family or your age or how many kids you have or where you live, I can guess who's going to buy based on how old they are and what their income is and all this other data points. But now the internet allows you to do that in a much mm. more efficient way, right? So it's just a different way of looking at these businesses. And maybe maybe these laundry, maybe the Ali Hassa people in this laundry business are saying, we don't care if we never make a dime off of laundry, but we'll make a ton of money off of the data that's associated with knowing what you're wearing hmm. and how often you clean it. Well, it's, the, it's the way to go, though. I think, you know, that's the future business model, isn't it? Because more and more so, the cost of the attention – of that consumer is the biggest cost of all in running the business, right? You know, it's Absolutely. actually getting the consumer to trust you enough to build a relationship with them. But once you have that relationship and you don't abuse it, you know, the chances of them buying, you look at the stats, any social media or any marketer will tell you people are what, seven times more likely to buy from somebody they've already bought from before. Sure. I'm sure those figures are only going to get higher and higher. So it's those businesses that have those lost leaders that go in build a platform establish a relationship and build on top of them whether it's laundry or your travel data package right exactly you know those are two interesting models because they're both well i think maybe this ali haza maybe we've given them too much credit but if they are doing that then it's on the right track it sure is but even if we're giving them too much credit Somebody out there is doing right. that. And I, I like this whole concept of consolidating and aggregating businesses under different brand names. It's really powerful. 
Yeah. Yeah. Big surprise. It'd be interesting to hear if there's anything out there. How can people get in touch with us this week, Michael? Well, they can tweet to me directly at Michael Waits. They, anything they post on Twitter, they can do hashtag Asia Tech Podcast. They can follow us on YouTube. They can come to our website, asiatechpodcast.com, and they can subscribe there as well. There are plenty of places, and on Twitter, or look for us on Twitter too. There are plenty of places where people can find us. We'll have more places where they can do this too. We've been in talks actually for a much wider distribution of this. We see more and more people actually listening to it every week. And we have different ways that we're going to distribute as well, not just in this region, but all over the world. So all that stuff is coming up to the ground. All coming up. Fantastic. Thanks, Michael. Thank you very much. You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.